Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back to Theology in Perspective. I'm Dr. Daniel Woodhead, and I'm blessed that you could join us again for our study of the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are looking at the initiating event that will start or signal the start of the Great Tribulation, and that's a covenant that this coming one world leader, euphemistically referred to as the Antichrist, will make with the people of Israel. And one wonders, why would they do this? Why would they do this? Well, God's Word tells us why they will do this. And here's what he says. In Isaiah 28, 14, he said, Hear the word of Jehovah, you scoffers, that rule this people that is in Jerusalem. So God considers them scoffers and mockers rather than serious leaders. And the text moves on in the 28th chapter of Isaiah to say, Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, and we are at agreement when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. It shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. So that's the reason they made the covenant with the Antichrist. They, they wanted to escape the overflowing scourge. They realized that a military effort is being planned against them, and they believe that a treaty instead of a relationship with God is going to help. This is not the first time the Jews have done this. Many, many, many of their kings have not trusted God and tried to get help from Syria, from Babylon, from the Assyrians, from Egypt. Now the text moves on and says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone of sure foundation. He that believeth shall not be in haste. So here, Isaiah is referring to the non-many <laughs> that refuse to enter into the covenant. Remember now, the many are the leaders. Now the text moves on to say, And I will make justice the line, and righteousness the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol shall not stand, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. As often as it passes through, it shall take you for morning by morning, it shall pass through by day and by night, and it shall be naught but terror to understand the message, for the bed is shorter than the man can stretch himself on it. In the over covering, or the covering, is narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. Oh, what a picture. For Jehovah will rise up in Mount Perizim. He will be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Well, that's the tribulation, the strange act. Now, therefore, be not scoffers, lest your bonds be made strong, for a degree of destruction have I heard from the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, upon the whole earth. So it's really clear, without the Lord Jehovah, without God, they will have insecurity instead of security. Insecurity instead of security. But we have reached a point in the book of Revelation where Jesus is in the throne room. 
Jesus is in the throne room. In chapter 5, we saw him receiving a scroll. The scroll that he received was written on the outside and on the inside. So both pieces of the paper, both sides of the paper, then it was rolled up. As it was rolled up, it would have a seal. Roll more, another seal. Roll more, another seal. And it was rolled all the way up until the seventh seal opened, or should I say the first seal in reverse, opened the first of the openings of the scroll. Now he hadn't opened the scroll because he was given the scroll being found worthy. The only entity that was found worthy under the earth, in the demonic realm, above the earth, in the celestial realm, and on the earth, in humanity. No one other than the Lord Jesus, the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world, was deemed worthy. So he took the scroll from God the Father in the throne room. The 24 elders are praising him and falling down and worshiping. The cherubim, the seraphim, the millions and millions of common angels are all shouting. And the seven spirits of God, the seven angels that are going to work with them to carry this out, are prepared. Jesus is ready to start the tribulation. We're going to move into chapter 6 right now, which is the beginning of the tribulation. In chapter 6, verse 1, is John the Apostle speaking in the first person. He's in the throne room of God. He sees these events taking place. And he says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat thereon had a bow, and there was given unto him a crown, and he came forth conquering and to conquer. Now the Apostle John, again, is speaking in the first person and he's seeing what's taking place there. These chair beings say very, very loudly, Come! Now the word come is a Greek word, echo may I, and for those of you that like to look these up, it's Strong's number 2064. It can either mean to come or go, but it's signifying the cherubim's command to the horse to either come forth from where it is onto the world scene or to go forth into the world scene. Just remember, the scene is in heaven, so the horse is in heaven, but the event that gets activated is on the earth in time and space. That's different than what the heavenly scene depicts. So John describes what he sees as this white horse departing with a rider. And this rider receives a crown and comes forth conquering. It's present tense here. And to conquer. Future tense. So he's saying he's going to conquer now and he's going to conquer. The present tense shows us his nature as a conqueror and his program is to conquer. Both of these are important to, be, to, to pay attention to because we have to observe this because we need to define who this individual is and what he's going to do. The bow is indicative of his armaments and the crown which he receives is a symbol of victory. And this is important for the identification of this rider because it's the Greek word Stephanos and again that's Strong's number 4735, which is one that's given to a victor that has that has prevailed in some event such as a sport or war. It's not the diadema, which is indicative of deity or a natural ruling authority. This is Strong's 1238. Remember now you got Strong's 4735, the Stephanos, and the diadem is 1238. 
This is not the diadem. This is not the natural order, the natural ruling authority or deity. This is somebody that's won something. Won something. He doesn't have title. He grabbed it. In other words, he didn't receive title in some natural way like God does. Now, one can attribute this to like kings and queens who received their crowns, the diadem, and the Lord Jesus who has this diadem that we see in Revelation 19. Uh, this is also the name that the crown, uh, of the crown that Satan has as the false father of the unholy trinity. Satan claims kingship in our lives and as the ruling authority of the earth. Just as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit represent the Holy Trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and we will see a character called the False Prophet represent the Unholy Trinity. We'll see that in Revelation chapter 13. Now, Satan could be viewed as the Unholy Father. The Antichrist is the Unholy Son, and the False Prophet is the unholy spirit. So the Antichrist receives his sadistic supernatural power, this crown from Satan, just as the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to call men to worship. Christ, the false prophet, will have as his mission to call men to worship the Antichrist. Now, what are the names of the Antichrist? The Antichrist are, uh, the names are very prevalent in, in Scripture. That's only one of them, the Antichrist, and that's the one that seems to have stuck in Christian lexicon, if you will. But the Scripture provides at least 11 names, and most of them are very descriptive. Um, of the 11, the following list here, uh, that I'm going to read for you, six are found in the Old Testament and five are in the New Testament. He is going to be the epitome of a counterfeit and the most powerfully persuasive dictator the world has ever seen. No one will have the power to persuade more than him. Adolf Hitler had similar power. Those that were close to him knew that this was a very alluring power that he had to bring people to him. And it was people that did not, don't, not, that did not know God. They were deceived. Just like these Jewish world leaders will be deceived and will sign this covenant with the Antichrist. They don't know God. They don't want to know God. And they will suffer for that. Now, he's called the seed of Satan in Genesis 3.15. He's called the little horn in Daniel 7, 8. In Daniel 8, 23, he's called the king of fierce countenance. Daniel 9, 26, he's called the prince that shall come. And in Daniel 9, 27, he's called the desolator. The desolator. Oh my goodness. And in Daniel 11, 36, he's called the willful king. Now, moving to the New Testament, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, he's called the man of sin. And in 2 Thessalonians, also in 2, 3, that, that's modified to include the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, he's called the lawless one. 1 John 2, verses 22, is the one that we're most familiar with. He's called the Antichrist. And then in Revelation 11, 7, he's called the Beast. The Beast of Revelation. Now it's interesting to know that Paul gives three of the names in one chapter of one book out of all of his writings. Paul was given special insight by the Lord Jesus to communicate to us. And the primary reason that the title Antichrist is so prevalent because it's the most descriptive of the nature of his role. 
he's going to be against the Messiah. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time with you today discussing the origin of the Antichrist. Since he is a counterfeit Christ, he's going to have a natural birth and a supernatural birth. The natural origin of the Lord Jesus is that he was a product of a Jewish woman, and the supernatural origin was the miraculous virgin birth by means of the power of the Holy Spirit. The result of this was the Lord Jesus is the God-man that we worship as Jesus of Nazareth. And we know as the Messiah, or, or the Christ, the Messiah is the Hebrew word for the Anointed One, and so is Christ, is the Greek word. They're actually both Anglicized terms, Messiah in Greek, or excuse me, in Hebrew, it is Mashiach, Mashiach, and Christ is Christos, Christos. They're different languages, but they both point to the same person. Now, the Antichrist is not going to be a Jew. There's no passages that declare him to be Jewish. Some people think that, but they don't have any good scripture to point to. He's going to be a Gentile. And the reason the Bible teaches us this is through three different means. Uh, Bible typology, typology, Bible imagery, and the names of the times of the Gentiles. The closest Bible typology that we have for the Antichrist is one person called Antiochus Epiphanes. He's a Gentile, or was a Gentile, and he was overthrown. He's one of the last Greek people to uh, control Israel, and he was overthrown approximately 165, 167 or so BC. And I uh, was overthrown by the um, <clears throat> by the uh, folks that rose up against him. That rose up against him, Judas Maccabeus and his folks. Now, in terms of Bible imagery, we see this Antichrist coming out of the sea, rising out of the sea. Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10, and Revelation 17, 15. The sea is used symbolically of Gentile nations, and the strongest key to his nationality is found in the times of the Gentiles. It's outside, which is contrary to the nar narrative of the times of the Gentiles, that a Jew would head up the final world throne. This has to be a Gentile. The entire times of the Gentiles, as the Lord Jesus spoken of, are laid out in the images in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. They're all Gentiles. And he's going to be a Roman, at least from a Roman woman. We don't need, know if he's going to live in Rome or whether he's... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He's going to be of Roman origin. Because Daniel 9, 26, in discussing the 70 weeks that we've gone over in our series here, says, And after three score and two weeks shall the anointed one be cut off and have nothing, or not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and even unto the time, uh, unto the end shall be war. Desolations are determined. And he shall make a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week shall he cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And upon the wing of abominations shall come one that maketh desolate. And even unto the full end, and that determined, shall wrath be poured out upon the desolate. Now the person makes a seven-year covenant with Israel is the Antichrist. Now Hebrew grammar dictates that the nearest antecedent to the he, if you will, a third masculine singular word in Hebrew, it's called who, 
is the prince that shall come. And that verse 26 lets us know that the prince that shall come is the same nationality as the people who will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now bear in mind, this was written uh, about 520 B.C. So future from then is the Roman invasion of Jerusalem by Titus Vespasian in that Jewish war that happened uh, starting in 66 A.D. and it went to 70. Now the Antichrist is a Gentile of Roman origin and the proper logical syllogism then would be he who makes a covenant and the prince shall come are the same person. They both have a reference to the Antichrist and the Antichrist is the same nationality as the people who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. So the Antichrist will be of Roman origin. How about his supernatural origin? He's going to be born in the world as a man. But the supernatural origin of Antichrist will be by means of a counterfeit virgin conception. Now the supernatural origin is found in Genesis 3.15 where the text there says, After the fall, God says, to Satan, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, the verse gives us the first prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. It also speaks to the coming of the Antichrist. And there are two pairs listed here the enmity between Satan and the woman. And the second pair is the seeds of the woman and the seed of Satan. The first satanic enmity with woman is shown in Genesis 6 where demons taking on human form intermarry with human women attempting to stop the Messiah from coming. And the result of this is God brings a worldwide flood to stop this and their product, the Nephilim. It's important to note that although the second pair is the enmity between Satan's seeds and the woman's seed, women don't have a seed for procreation. Men do. Women have an egg. However, since Jesus was born of a virgin, the expression, her seed, represents a miraculous conception. And the reference in this verse to Satan's seed implies a supernatural miraculous conception too. So from this passage then we can we can see that Satan will someday impregnate a Roman woman who will give birth to Satan's seed who's going to be the Antichrist. The woman might not be a virgin because the scripture doesn't affirm that but he says that this will be a conception through supernatural means. Paul talks about this too in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 8 and 9. Look what he says, and then shall be revealed the lawless one whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to naught by the manifestation of his coming. Even he whose coming is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now the Greek word translated uh, working here is energeo. Energeo. And it means to energize. So, so the coming of the Antichrist is going to be brought about by the energizing of Satan. The counterfeit son of the unholy trinity will be brought about by a counterfeit virgin conception. Time is coming, folks, when the events of Genesis 6, where the fallen angels took on human form and had intercourse with women, producing the Nephilim, which led to the flood. Now, the fallen angel the fallen cherub, I should say, 
who's now Satan, it will impregnate a Roman woman and give birth to Satan's son. The product of this conception will be a counterfeit God-man. Now, it's interesting is that people think, well, angels can't have intercourse with women. Of course they can't. But they take on human form, and then they can have intercourse. The book of Hebrews tells us that there are angels walking about among us. They have come to visit Abraham and others, and they take on the form of young men. So this is accurate according to Scripture. Now I'm going to look at, just for a moment before we close here, the character and the rise of Antichrist. And we'll finish this in our next session, in, 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 the, the, the next time we meet. It, because the Antichrist is going to have access to the satanic and the demonic realm. He's going to accept the offer that Jesus refused when he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan. When he accepts Satan's offer of all the kingdoms of the world, it's going to mark the beginning of his rise to political power and world domination. Daniel chapter 11 verses 38 to 39 and Revelation 13 too. The church may be here to see his rise. We don't know when God will take us out at the rapture and resurrection because that can happen any time before the tribulation starts and the starting event is the signing of the seven year covenant with Israel. So his rise to power is described in two passages and the first is Daniel 8 23 to 25 where it says in the latter time of their kingdom when the transgressors are come to the full a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and do his pleasure. And he shall destroy the mighty ones and the holy people. And though his policy, and through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and in their security. Shall he destroy many, and he shall also stand up against the princes. But he shall be broken without hand. So the king of fierce countenance is Antichrist, and he's going to be able to understand dark sentences, which is the occult. He's going to have Satan behind him, and this is the occult. His power is going to be mighty, but not by himself. It's going to be by Satan. He will have access to a tremendous amount of power from Satan. And he's going to seek to destroy the holy people, the Jews, with his supernatural power. It'll be characterized by craftiness and deceit. So be just like Adolf Hitler. He's going to lull the world into this false sense of security. And for a time, it'll prosper and be successful. And people will admire his goals. And then he shall magnify himself in his heart. And this will lead to his declaration of his deity. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 to 4, and Revelation 13, verses 3 to 9, clearly say that he's going to declare himself God. He's going to stand against the prince of princes, the Messiah. Therefore, he will truly be anti-Christ. Now, beloved, I'm going to close there for today, and we'll pick this up in our next session. We are now in, in, we're actually in the book of Revelation in the sixth chapter. The Lord Jesus opened the first seal, and it was the Antichrist taking off. These things are going to happen, folks. And the only way to avoid these is to be off the earth, as Jesus said. And the way to get off the earth is you go up in the rapture. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. There is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Believe that Jesus died and rose again, a historic fact, and you will not be here for these events that are coming on this world. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. 
Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. If you would like a DVD of today's program, please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420, or call us at 877 877- 7062479 that's 877 7062479 once again 877 7062479 the cost is $15 let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast we look forward to providing you with continuing bible messages each week on this station god bless you To the land of Zion Next year in Jerusalem The Shana Haba'a The Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear O Lord, thy kingdom come Thy will be done next year The Shana Haba'a The Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem 